Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. And I hope that you will do so. Please understand, I'm a teacher, not a preacher. Okay? I did that deliberately. People say, you should be, no, 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 no. I mean, I like to interact with people. So there is no dumb questions. And we'll give you time to ask questions or whatever that kind of situation. And we're going to actually do some activities. We are not going to just sit here. We're going to move around, well, we'll move around a little bit for one of the items. But I want you to know what this is about. When you hear the idea of tracking God, what does that all mean? Okay? Tracking is a situation where you are following somebody that is leaving a trail. Now, has anybody heard of J. Warner Wallace? Anybody? J. Warner Wallace? J. Warner Wallace was in God is Not Dead 2. Anybody seen that one? Okay. He is the uh, detective on, in, in the witness box talking, and he says, you know, I, I was an uh, atheist for 35 years, and I studied, and I found myself coming in, Okay. I'm going to be using some of the material that he has come up with. I actually got into this much earlier than that. John Douglas, who worked with the FBI, was the one that came up with the idea of profiling serial killers. And what happened was is that I was teaching, and I heard him speak on the radio about the, the, um, uh, the guy who was sending uh, bombs through the mail. Unabomber. The Unabomber, yeah. And he, this was in, this was in January, and he had just written a book that had come out in the spring. And he was describing who this guy had to be, and he says he's made a terrible mistake because he has demanded that his manifesto of forty-nine thousand words plus has to be published in the Boston Globe and in the Washington Post, or he'll start killing again. And then I had the newspaper of the day that they caught Ted Kaczynski in Montana. And I took it to my classroom and I read to them from his book, which had come out a year before, and said, this is who you're looking for. And someone's going to sit there and find out who it is. And then I read to them out of the day's newspaper. And my 7th and 8th graders go, what? How did he know all of those things? And, and it was very, very interesting. And all of a sudden, you know, it started there. Now, what actually got started with tracking is, is that we were in Kenya, East Africa, for four years. And our backyard, 10 minutes away, was the National Game Park. And we saw everything but elephants. And what's really interesting is, is that you think when you get into a game park, you're going to find animal over here, over, oh, yeah. And it's, no. You go in there, and there's nothing. Well, I take that back. First time we got in, uh, there were baboons playing with our windshield wipers, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know, well, you know whatever. But, you know, you want to see the cats. You want to see the, the, the giraffe and all that other kind of stuff. And I found out that they don't do, you know, I was hoping to get really nice pictures of animals. They don't come out and say, hey, would you like to take my picture a little bit? Yeah, oh, yeah. No, they don't do that. Okay? You've got to track them. And the way that you track them is you say, okay, so where's the water? Well, they're going to have to go to the water, so when are they going to go to the water? Um, if you see some animals, you'll see certain things and you go, whoa, wait a minute here. And then, you know, things will just happen just like, wow, look at that. I turned the corner and there's something right there and, you know, it kind of gets interesting. But tracking is a lot more than that. And I want to show you that process and I want to connect it with Bible study. And the reason why is, is because... If you're going to worship somebody, you've got to know who they are. And, and the, the thing that I'd like for us to understand is right here. God is our Heavenly Father. And the point is, is that He wanted His people, because of sin, to know who He is. So the Holy Spirit's revelation, He, he reveals Himself to the author. Okay, and the author writes things down as he best, you know, as he understands that situation. Holy Spirit, so he's not making up his own words here. And we'll find out why that's the truth. 
But interesting enough, through inspiration, and I'm sorry, that should have been a P in there. But anyway, he writes it in the Bible. And so what happens there is, is that um, through illumination, we're able to read it. Now watch what happens here. We start here, and we want to know God. So we read the Bible, and we end up with questions. You see? So we really work hard. Okay, how do I understand the Bible? Okay? And so we say, well, how did it write? And we do this, and we look at Greek and Hebrew and all this other kind of stuff. And you go, okay, all right. And then we said, well, we need to ask the guys who wrote it. And then we start getting into, well, who wrote it and who didn't write it and all that other kind of stuff that happens. And then finally, and what's really interesting is that we're supposed to figure out who God is. And the thing that I found was really interesting is, is that when you start reading your Bible, you're reading a whole different book than you and I thought was, at least it was for me. And I want to share with you what that's like and how you can do it because the way that it was written. And that's really, really important. So I want to start right away. And I'm so glad that we have something up here so I don't have to stand like this all the time. Um, It probably wouldn't hurt if I turned it on. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. It did for a second. Okay, it's on green. And there you go. Okay. All right. First thing I need, Carl, could I ask you to help me? First thing I want you guys to do. Uh oh. Nope. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what. I went through all of this. Could, could we make some real quick copies? Is that possible? Could somebody make about 15 on that one? Okay. We're going to put you on a little situation here where you're going to look for a perfect star in a very interesting puzzle and it's coming we're going to make it I thought I had it and it's somewhere in my room okay and the reason why is is this because how many of you sat there and you read something in the bible and you go I'm supposed to be really excited about this but why am I not you know or or yeah oh I know that story oh yeah I've heard it so many different times well guess what One of the things you need to understand about the Bible, and and I'll be honest, I'm dealing with the book of Genesis here. And I'm doing it deliberately because I want to show you that the Hebrews' way of looking at Scripture is stuff that you and I miss. We're pretty good with New Testament stuff, but Old Testament stuff, ah, you know, that's way too... And I'll tell you what, it is absolutely brilliant the way that it is written, the way it's need to be understood in such a way that it becomes far more involved. Why? Because what happens is, is that we don't have the meaning to the words. We are justified by faith. What in the world does that mean? I can look that up in the dictionary and yet does it necessarily tell you what that actually means? And so we need to watch what happens. Now, um, we're starting to hand something out. You're going to want to get in at least groups of two. And if you will look at the instructions behind me, don't compare with each other. You do it within your own group. Don't mark on the sheet. uh, sheet. If you think you found the perfect star, only raise your hand. Don't talk about it. Don't point to it. There's a reason. I'll explain it. Don't show or tell another person where the star is. And when you finish, please return the the things. Okay? Now, I want you to take some time. It's deliberate. Um, You may be able to ask some questions and I'll determine whether or not I'll help you. But here's the point. Help me understand what was going through your mind when I said, you're looking for a perfect star. 
The first question came out, and it was a good one. How many points? Okay? Now, the reason why is, is because notice our expectations. I'm looking for a perfect star, but nobody gave you parameters to be able to figure out what that really was. And so therefore you say it could have been a, a, a four part star or a six point star or something like that. Did it bother you the fact that it was made up of both black and white colors? Yes. Okay, all right. So again, notice I wasn't telling you a lie. It is there, you've seen it, but was looking for something else or didn't know what you were looking for. My question to you is, what do you think about the idea of tracking God? What does that even mean? What could that possibly mean? Difficult. I think it's just the opposite, but from where you stand, sir, you're absolutely right. Because we can't see him, we don't hear him, we read about him, and all that other kind of stuff, and we all read these stories and you go, yeah, maybe, maybe, you know. We struggle with this. Christians, we struggle with this stuff. Okay? And my point that I want to make here is, is this. I'm asking you to forego some things and let's just do some tracking instead. Okay? What you just did is a track. That you were sitting there saying you knew what you were looking for, a perfect star, but you need more information to be able to make that happen. But the more important thing was is to be able to recognize it for what it is. Now, if I said we're tracking God, how do you actually do that? Okay, now I'm going to show you some of the things that we don't think about. So here's the next little spot here. Okay. The story in your Bibles is Luke chapter 10. If you'll turn in your Bibles, and I hope that you have Bibles to look at, because you can't go to a Bible study seminar without studying your Bible, and you've got to have one. So, hey, can you turn the lights up there? Hey, that would be good. Okay. Actually, oh, yeah. Does that work better for you? More better. Oh, that's even better. Okay. okay, all right, so here's the point. You know the story. What's the story about? I'm so, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. What's the story? Huh? A rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this here. I'm going to give you a few details that might help you to make a little bit more of an understanding. Number one, he's a lawyer. He's a, he is a religious lawyer. He is a Pharisee. Does that tell you anything more about what's going to go here? Is this going to be a good, like, oh, whatever you say, it's great. This is not going to happen. You already know the story. Okay? Now, take a look at the lawyer's question. He says, what, is, what, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Is that a good question? Sure. Okay? What does he expect Jesus to say? Yeah, ABC, yeah, ABC, that, that kind of situation, okay? What does Jesus say back to him? Okay, now wait a minute. He asks a question, but the bigger thing is what, is, what is the question? He says, what is in, written in the law? What's this guy who's asking the question? A, ro a, a religious lawyer. Does he not know what the law already says? Are you starting to get... Somebody's already laughing. This is, this is what happens so oftentimes when you start actually thinking about what's being said. He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Good question. Well, you're a royal, you're, you're religious lawyer. Uh, what do you read in the law? And notice what he says. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with your soul and strength, with all your might, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus says, you got it. So why'd you ask me? Yes. He wants Jesus to affirm him. Yes. Okay. He wants Jesus to affirm him. In front of other people. Or he might be trying to trap him. Okay. But we'll have to see that. And then Jesus says, well, you're right. Okay, so do that. And, and so that's it. But the lawyer's not finished. And he says, well, who's my neighbor? Now, what you've got to understand here is who do you think, who would you think, given your knowledge of this, 
what, who's he talking about? What's he afraid of? What does he do, not want to hear? He doesn't want to hear that it's a Gentile. Yes, very, absolutely. Okay, now watch this because we know about the Pharisees. They've already been playing this game with Jesus. All right, so we got that kind of situation. So he doesn't want to hear this. Now, what happens if Jesus says, well, you know what the word neighbor means? He doesn't do that. He doesn't sit there and parse that. What he does is he tells them a story. Take a look. Now watch. I'm going to tell you the story a little bit kind of like the way that the Jews talk about because I, I converse with some of these guys, the Orthodox rabbis, and very, very interesting what they will say, how they read stories. Okay, This is what happened. A certain man is going from what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Down to, down to the, okay, now what you've got to catch here is, is this. The temple is on the mountain, and you're going down to the lowest place on earth. Interesting enough, that's going down to Jericho. Jericho is just a little bit north of the Dead Sea, which is known, by the way, as the pit, which is a euphemism for what? I think somebody already knows. It's the what? Hell. It's hell. Yeah, okay, so in other words, he's going from there to death, Okay, he's on, his, so he's on his way down in his life. Okay, this is how they play the metaphors here. And they say, okay, and he got beaten up by some things and left by the side of the road. Okay, now watch. So who comes by? The priest, right? And he looks at him and he says, no, no, no. You know, I really can't do anything. I really don't know who he is and I'm just, I'm not going to. So I, I'm too much in a hurry to get where? No, he's not going that way. He's going to hell. He's going to death. He's going to the grave. Okay? All right, so now watch what happens here. So then a Levite comes by and he looks, you know, I really should do something about that. But you know, nah, it's too complicated. I'm not going to do anything. So let's just go on to, yeah, to the grave. Yeah, to the grave. Okay, so now watch what happens. A Samaritan comes by and sees him and he takes care of him and takes him back up to, to the, the inn, takes care of him, does all this kind of situation, and then he says, okay, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll, if there's any more money, I'll take care of all that situation. Now, what's really interesting about this is, is the fact that all of this is for answering the question, who's my neighbor? What does Jesus say? The lawyer asks, well, who's my neighbor? He was loaded with, with prejudice and dislike. He, uh, like so many other Jews, wanted to limit their favors to those who were deemed deserving. Jesus saw this and instead he tells a story. Why? How did this story influence a de definition or a statement of fact? What is this? What's that story for? What's it telling? And the interesting part is, Jesus ends up his story by saying what? What does it say? Luke 10. Who showed mercy? Who showed mercy? And he says, and what does the man say? Go, go, go into uh -huh. He didn't say Samaritan. He doesn't. He does not say Samaritan. He says the man that. Okay, now, what I want you to catch here is this. Instead of giving him a, quote, straight answer, Jesus says, so who acted as the neighbor? You see what he did? He got to what he really needed to hear. Please. Every teacher, multiple choice question. He said, which one of the three is yeah. the neighbor? That's right. That's exactly right. And, and the point is, is that there. Now, what I want you to understand here is, is that Jesus is using questions. Anybody read any books by Kaim Potok? Anybody heard of him? The Promise, The Chosen, not the, the new television thing. He's a rabbi. He, he grew up as a Hasidic Jew, ended up going through things and came out at the other end as a Reformed Jew. But he told me this when I met him in, in La Sierra. He said, my father never looked at my grade card to find out how well I was doing in school. Okay, so what did he do? I was required by my father to go to his office on Friday afternoon, and I'd sit on his lap, 
and I was to recite all the questions I was asking the teacher during the week. And based upon the quality of questions, he knew how well I was doing in school. Now, does that sound anything like our, what do you want on the test? Help me write it down so I can write it down on the test and pass the test. See what's happened? This is what we tend to do in the West. He's sitting there saying, what kind of questions? The more questions you learn to ask to find out things, that's making something different. That's how the Jews think. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, when your son asks you four times, four times, he said, when your son asks you this question, tell him this. And you find it all over the place. So what I'd like to suggest to you is, is that we in the West have been listening to, well, give me the answer, and I want whatever the textbook says or whatever it is. That, that's what we tend to do. I mean, I know that we're not supposed to, but we do it. You, you know, we've all done that. And we figure that we've answered the question. But I want you to take a look at what we have here. The conceptual theologians explore concepts to determine the truth. And they do it by step-by-step -step logic. Not a bad thing at all. It becomes more abstract, though. Have you ever gotten into a discussion where the words just start going back and forth, and you go, wait a minute, what does that mean? What do you mean by that phrase? And, what do you, and it just keeps going back and forth. It tends to be difficult for the average student. You say, well, look, I just look for a simple answer. Back and forth. You know? Now, I want you to understand very clearly, and I want to underline this, Jesus did not ignore legal questions with legal answers. He did not. He did it all the time. However, the problem is, is that you can't deal with that very well. Now, the reason why is, is if you look at metaphor, metaphorical theologians, creation, it creates meaning and comprehension. How did Jesus answer the, the lawyer? By telling him a story. The story gave him context, and the context told him, you know who you should be helping. And the guy says, I really didn't want to hear that, you know? And so this is what happens. Take a look. He uses metaphors, similes, parables, dramatic action. He does with Old Testament prophets. They'll sit there and say, oh, I want you to do this and this. What am I doing? You know, Hosea is really, you know, I want you to go out and like that. And Hosea, your wife is acting like Israel. Okay, that gets there. Now, to not replace step-by-step -step logic, but to bring the truth to where it is understood, and we commit ourselves to doing that. We're talking about faith works by love. We're not talking faith and works. We're talking faith works by love. If you really believe it, let me give you a simple illustration here. Again, notice I'm using a story. Blondell was one of the great... Uh, high uh, wire walkers in the late 1800s and every so often he'd go to the Niagara Falls and he would do this. This time he was going to uh, walk it with a blindfold on and pushing a wheelbarrow over Niagara Falls. Okay, now watch this. Just before he puts down the, the, the eye patches, he turns to the crowd and he says, how many of you guys think I'm going to make it? And there's kind of, well, you know, and he gets all this kind of stuff. Fine, he says, I do, I, I believe you do it. He says, fine, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> People, if we don't get in the wheelbarrow, where's our faith? Faith without works is dead. So what the idea being is, is that God wants us to understand that, what is it going to take? What did it take for that man to get in that wheelbarrow? Other than possible, what? He had to sit there and say, you know what? How many times has he gone? He's gone across four times. I don't know what it was, but he'd have to sit there and say, does he, does he really know what he's doing? You know, he has to sit there and he has to be, and watch this word, persuaded, convinced. Did you know that the word faith in the New Testament comes from the word pistis, which root word means to persuade and convince you don't have true faith if you're not persuaded and convinced that the person that says, I can do this, can honestly do it. So my question to you is, how in the world is someone going to show you and me that he is truth and he's telling you that I can do exactly what I said I did? 
You see what's happening here? This is a whole new bag if you think about it. This is not the usual ways we talk about faith. You know, and, and I mean, you got to think about it. How in the world does Moses get across on the other side of the Red Sea? Try the other one. We're going to get into another story at the end, a well-known story, and I'm going to ask it again. But before we do that, I want us to start learning some stuff here. This is taken out of a uh, book that's just been called, called The Hebrew Way of Knowing. And for those of you that are theologically oriented, it's called Oral Hermeneutics. And it's talking about story. When the listener or disciple discovers the meaning himself, ah, we heard that today, didn't it? Ah, yeah, I got that. Okay? Then he or she retains that truth much better and they own it as their truth. If facts are spoon-fed, listen to this carefully, parents, because if your children are just getting that stuff, they're not getting it educated. That's coming from a teacher. Okay? If facts are spoon-fed by lectures or monologue to a more passive mind or a mind that cannot connect a concept to an image, like imagining it, it may go in one ear and out the other, as the saying goes. Now, I'm going to be bold, people, today and tomorrow. Are we struggling with, we're hearing the gospel and it's go here and You understand what I'm... I'm not going to pull any punches here, people. It's too late for that. We, we dream in stories, not in bullet points. I mean, come on. I mean, we got to start... And I'll tell you what. This is, this is so cool. When I saw young people get into this kind of stuff, okay? It's just exciting to see young people do this. The tragedy of life is not what we suffer. It's what we miss. How much are we missing of what God really is and wants for us? And how much has He done for us on a day-to-day -day basis? How in the world did these disciples just sit there and say, throw caution to win. God has called us. We're going to go. We're going to do it. We're going to say what has to be said, or whatever. And they deal with it. Okay? Now, here's the value of circumstantial evidence. Since this is really important. Court juries are told to not differentiate between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. How many times have you heard on television, well, we only have circumstantial evidence and that won't work? Anybody ever heard that phrase? Everything? Guess what? However, there is a need of many circumstantial pieces of evidence to make that solid case. Direct evidence is often susceptible to eyewitness not telling the truth. So just because you have eyewitnesses doesn't mean that they're telling the truth. You've got to somehow find out if persuaded and convinced that they're telling the truth. Now, do you see J. Warner Wallace's Cold Case Christianity? He's got a book that's called Cold Case Christianity. I recommend it. He, was a, he um, has done a variety of things. What he did was is that he would be called in on a cold case... And he is actually one cases. Anybody know who Robert Shapiro is? Who's Robert Shapiro? He's a lawyer. Absolutely, a very good one. And he was one of O.J. Simpson's. J. Warner Wallace walked in with only circumstantial evidence in a California court and beat Robert Shapiro. And the, and the perp came up to him afterwards and he says, I don't know how you did it, but you had me every place. Every detail you had was the truth. And you didn't even see me, didn't do anything like that. You knew. You saw the evidence and it, there it was. He had 80 to 90 pieces of little bits of pieces that he put it together. It says, only you could do that. He basically just took, you know, there's a 97% chance that you're not going to be able to figure out what it is. And it just kept going down, kept going down, until finally there was only one person that fit all of those pieces of information. I'm suggesting that we can do the same thing with God. And that's what the Bible's full of. So I want to show you how I've seen that. And I'll tell you what, my kids, they, they enjoyed that. That's what they remember. It's not me, they remember. I learned how to read my Bible. And that is nice. Now, we are going to do the next activity.
Right, absolutely. Okay. All right. Now, people, this is lots of fun. But I want you to understand that the skills that you were using and learning to use here, after a while, you guys start catching on. And the point that I, if you could pick those things up, keep the, keep the answer sheet, but I need to have the other ones because I use those again and again. But anyway, I want you to understand that you can look at something and, and understand certain things about it. And if you keep going, you can actually find out a lot more than you ever thought. I'm saying, what did I say? The tragedy in life is not what men suffer. It's what they miss. Okay, so here's the point. How much do you think we've been looking for about Jesus that we're not re we want to find out, but don't know how to find it? Which is what we just showed ourselves, didn't we? We do a lot of this. Now, if you were in God's position, or let's just put mom and dad, or you know, didn't anybody, and you want companionship and you want to enjoy the lives of other people, would you be satisfied with hit and miss? No. We talk about our Heavenly Father. And you sit there and you go, how much does He want to be with me? Have you ever thought what it means for Him to be sitting where He is and we're here? Has that ever crossed our minds? And you sit there and you go, well, what's it like? I mean, you know, as parents, we learn this real fast with our kids. And kids, it's going to be your turn to come around afterwards and you're going to find out the same thing. You're going to say, I want to be close but I don't know how to do that. Or there's extenuating circumstances like, well, we kind of blew it in our lives and we don't know how to get back. And so we struggle. And how many people struggle with this kind of stuff? This is nothing new. This is not just limited to a few people. We all struggle with this. And what this is all about is this idea of learning to say, God's been dropping hints all over the place. And I got to show you how many times that the Bible does this. And all day tomorrow, we're just going to take passages, stories that you have already studied. There's nothing new. But I want to show you how much you've missed, how much I've missed. And every day I'm learning more stuff. I go, wait a minute, I didn't ever saw that before. And I'm going, that's just, and it's that much more. And I want to catch with that. So. Let me go on here. I want to go to John chapter 5. So take your Bibles. I want us to start thinking along this line of what we're seeking for, what kind of things we're looking for. Okay? This is a well-known story, John chapter 5, yet there are lessons to be learned from how the story took place. Okay? Now, I realize because of my job, I get to study this stuff a whole lot more time than some of you have. And I understand that. So please don't feel like, oh, you know, I'll never know enough. No, no, no. You will always have something. God always sends spiritual manna for you every day. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tomorrow. Oh, actually, we'll have one more. I have a quiz for you. Okay. Oh, I do. yeah. Notice he loves quizzes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So here we go. This is something you didn't know, probably. And but you've got to ask the question: Where did this story take place? Now, if you will look at it, you will see the Temple Mount. Okay. The Temple Mount is there on the left. The eastern wall, the eastern gate was the Golden Gate. And you, if you are standing, you, you, this picture or this distance right here, you are, we would be standing on the Mount of Olives looking down. And this is what we would see. Okay? Alright, so we got that. Now, the crucifixion is in the top left-hand corner outside the gate, they think. There are three places where they think that took place. That one actually looks like the skull. And it's called the place of the skull. So there are those who personally say that this is where it is and the garden uh, tomb is off to the side. It may or may not. I'm not going to sit there and play with that kind of stuff. I'm not an archaeologist per se. Okay? But I want you to know, now the Antonio is those four columns right there, those four towers on each side. That's where Pilate's office was. 
Okay, we know that. That's, that's for sure. As a matter of fact, the floor is still there. Um, there's actually a game that was actually carved into the stone that's there. And they would play these things among the soldiers as to whether or not, you know, who gets to do all the bad stuff to the next victim. Really scary stuff. Okay, so anyway, so they've got that. Now, I want you to see where Bethesda is there. Do you see that over on the right-hand side? Now, in that particular airy place, there are five porches. They have found them. I have a picture later on if you want to look at it, but the point is I didn't want to waste the time here, but I, that's where it was. Now, please notice that there is a pathway. Now, I don't know if that's the exact pathway. This is actually taken from the... Um, uh, there is a museum now. This used to be next to a hotel, but now they've moved it. And this is 150th scale of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, which is a really nice... And by the way, you can go online and you can look at it. Just ask for the image of, you know, uh, the city of Jesus at the time you know, of his life, and you will actually see this thing. And it's huge. It really is. And they, they've done this. Now, is it perfect? No. But I want you to understand something. The placing of these things are found. We know where the wall was. We know where Bethsaida is. We know where the Antonio was. But notice something else. There is a pool. We call it... Um, oh, come on. No, no. I am not remembering stuff tonight. No, it's not Bethsaida. It's... it's uh, Anyway, it's a pool of, of cleansing. Okay, it's a pool of cleansing. Now, it's a pool of Israel. So, what is the name? Uh, who is this guy that's at Bethesda who hasn't walked for 38 years? What, what is his background? He's a, he's a Jew. He said, okay, now. What you think about this? Okay, now, what you have here, take a look at the pathway right there in between where it says Pool of, of Israel and Antonio. There is a pathway. There is a gate there. It's called the Sheep Gate. That's where they would bring the animals to be offered as, as things. So that would be there. This is on what day? This is on the Sabbath. Okay? All right, so you ready for this? Okay, this man, a certain man, on the Sabbath day, is sitting at Bethesda. Now, you need to know what that was. Escapulus is a Greek mythology who was known not only for his healing and life-giving powers, but for an attitude of benevolence for the people which made him one of the most popular divinities in Greco-Roman world. Later in the story, Jesus would meet the man and healed in the temples, Israel's temple and would warn him not to continue in his life of sin. This explains that the crumpled man's presence at the pool of Bethesda, he put his faith in a scapulus and not in God. And Jesus noticed him. What you think about this? Have we been there before? Have we been where we weren't supposed to be? Does God know where you're at? And what does he think? Shame on you. Well, you, should, you know better than that. Uh, we've heard that, some of us. Okay? But I want you to catch this. Digging into the stories. <laughs> Why would a Jew be at a pagan healing temple on the Sabbath? Why would a Jew be at a pagan temple on the Sabbath day? That's where you thought. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. The, you raised your hand. Okay. Uh, when, I, when I was in Egypt, Alexandria, I saw that the Jews had blended a lot of their, a lot of their practice with the Greeks and the Romans. They were okay. merging. We see that again in, with the Roman Catholic Church where you know, a lot of the pagan rites and saints and all. There could be that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you what, we, we evangelicals are good. We're good at this too. Yeah. You know? but, but yeah. I'm thinking that that's probably what's going on here is that uh, there was some kind of blending of the thought of you know. Uh, would the, okay, plurality. would a Pharisee put up with something like this? I don't know. The Pharisee was a oh, shame on you. That would have been that complete. Please, Pastor. Oh, he had, um, it looks to me like he had lost faith in, in God's healing power, so he yeah. tried something else. Yeah. yeah. How many times have we done this, people? Are we any different this, this, than this man? 
I tried everything I thought, you know, he wants. You know, and you've got to realize that the Pharisees are going to say, you know what, shame on you. You must have been a real bad sinner to have this kind of stuff happen to you. Have we seen people that get hit like that? Have you seen them walk away just going, I give up? Can't do that, people. We can't. Jesus didn't. Do you know what the risk that Jesus took to do this? He's by himself. He's walking in crowds on the Sabbath day. He's walking by. And he looks at this guy and he's going, no, this isn't right. This isn't all that kind of stuff. But if I do anything, it's going to get right back to the Pharisees. And they're going to get really upset. And all I'm trying to do is help this guy. Sarvages puts it this way. He sees, he walks by, he sees the whole, everybody there. And then he sees this one guy who looks like he's just absolutely wasted. It's just like he's got absolutely nothing going for him at all. And it says he couldn't pass him by. He couldn't pass him by, people. So where does he go? A place where we would expect Christians to go on Sabbath? You see what see we're starting to get, now this is starting to get kind of close here. Okay, so he does that. So he knows what he's doing. He says, I can't do this. I have to do this. Okay? So why would Jesus take the risk to heal on the Sabbath day in such a prominent place? If he does this, what's going to happen? The guy's going to jump up and go, I'm healed, I'm healed. And everybody's going to know who did it. Yes. He did do it. Absolutely. That's the cool part. He did it. Now, watch how he does does it. This is kind of cool. Okay. Why would you try to stand up if a stranger told you that you were healed? I want you to think about this. We don't think about the obvious in this story. He sits there and he says, Would you like to be healed? And the guy said, no, I'm just sitting sitting here because i got nothing else to do. I mean, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, you could come back with a really smart answer and you just go like, duh, you know. Why does Jesus ask that question? He wants to trust your faith. All right. Okay. Now, I want you to see that because you said the the special word. It's faith. Okay. Now, yes, please. Yeah. In other words, that, that, that's the thing. I mean, he, he wants to, maybe he's heard of it. We don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know. But the Bible, yes, please. I think Jesus wants to give him what he wants to. Yes. Because if, you know, if he says, if he doesn't get up when he hears that he's healed, it means that he didn't really want it. You know what I mean? Like he's not. Okay, so in other words, it's kind of like, how much do you really want this? Kind of, but it's, I also see it as, as Jesus being, Respectful, okay. Because he's he's saying, you know, do you want to be made well? And he says, I want it. You know, you're healed. Get up. And it that that's what I see. Because if if he doesn't want it, okay. So in other words, again, this is where the faith comes in. Yeah, that's good. Good point. Yes, please. But the man never says here that he wants it. He starts explaining the hopelessness of his situation and the fact that others aren't able to help him, he doesn't have anybody to help him. I think about when I used to deal with homeless people in downtown San Diego and we would you know, try to help them and then we'd come back and the same people were in the same yeah. place in the same lifestyle and they just didn't see any way out. Okay, I think we've got two different points of view here and that's really good because either way we're describing two legitimate ways in which we would be kind of like, do I, do I really going to do this kind of stuff? And we've been in both places. And I think when we start seeing this, it isn't that we always get exactly what happened there. It starts sparking us to say, well, where does it fit in my life? Have I, have I been doing it that way or have I been doing it that way? Either way, you're still missing out. See, this is the point. And Jesus says, I just want you to be healed. Okay, so he sits there. (laughs) And he's been, remember, he's been sitting there for 35, 38 years. He is waiting for somebody to pick him up and throw him in the water before anybody else gets in the water. Does God work that way? No, he does not work that way. Okay, so Jesus does. He says, stand, take up your bed and walk. Depend on others. 
Well, okay, we could we could possibly do that. Yes. Okay, say that again. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Well, th that's all right. In other words, what you said was is that you know he, if he doesn't, then he's. Jesus isn't going to give him the ability to walk. Okay. So uh, okay. So in other words, faith has to be involved here. Why does faith have to be involved in this story? But why? Okay, he's got to believe. Okay. What's your definition of faith? Convince? It's persuade and convince. Okay, so in other words, the point being is, is that God's wanting us to understand that he is the creator. See? If he's, if, you know, there. So the, the, the point that I want us to make here isn't necessarily did we get the right answer. What's really important to me is the fact that two specific things were said that fit the situation. So we don't have to necessarily say one or the other unless the text specifically says something, and that's what we were. But watch what happens here. Jesus says, stand, take up your bed, and walk. Okay? Now, what would convince that man from his position that Jesus had the ability to make this happen. Please. I'm, I, I'm wondering, um, he's been there for 38 years, he's crippled, mm -hmm. so he can't get to the water first, uh, this pagan pool um, that he is putting all of his chips into. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, in fact, if this is the first time he's ever been asked by somebody else, not the thought that you'd like to be, but ask, do you want to be healed? And, and, and am I wrong or right? Well, Jesus asked this question, and, and, and therefore, maybe he's never been asked that question. He's, just, he's, he's a scumbag kind of individual. He didn't look very handsome at all, just laying there, and he can't move. And Jesus asked him for the first time, do you want to be healed? And, and I think that might be the, the beginning, the spark of in other faith words, in something else. Okay, let, let, let besides me. Besides the water. Look, let me see if I understand you correctly. What I'm hearing from you is the idea that somebody cares, somebody honestly cares, really actually thinks of my needs. He's not seen that from probably too many people. Okay? So if ever. Okay? So, so. Because here's the point. You need to realize that when something like that happened, they said, God is punishing you for your sins. Okay? So that is it. We, we need to understand that is all throughout the New Testament. Well, you know, that person must have really done something wrong to get treated that way. Pastor, please. Yeah, I, I see another possibility. Okay. Um, and Dave gave me a thought too is, you know, when Jesus said, do you want to be made well? Jesus wants to heal him. And then that's probably coming through in the way he asks. And so that might even give the man, you know, a glimmer of, of hope, something to hang his faith on. And then he says, it, it's almost, it, it's a possibility that he could be kind of hinting for Jesus to put him in the water. Because he says, hey, I don't have anyone to put me in the water. You're, you want to make me well? you know, put me in the water. And then Jesus kind of sidesteps the water and shows that he's God. Yeah, okay. I think what you're, what you're getting at is, is something a little bit deeper. And, and that's the point that I want us to make here. How many of us feel like we can identify with this man? You see, this is my point. So if we read this story, what would make you, let's, let's turn it on us, what would make you get up based upon the story? Please. It's interesting that he says, Arise, take up your bed and walk, and later they call him out for carrying his bed on the Sabbath. Oh, I know. So I wonder, I wonder if Jesus maybe in between the lines is saying, What are you doing here? Why are you here in this pagan temple? You're a Jew. You're way, you, you feel like you're, you, you're helpless and you're relying on looking for somebody else to bail you out of your circumstances, God can take care of it. Just get up, get your stuff, get out of here. You don't belong here. Okay. 
But I, I, I'm, I need to throw something in here. And that is this. How did he end up there? He would have to go to the Pharisees and, the, and the, the priests would have to declare him unclean. Therefore, he's not allowed to go to any of those places because he's a sinner. And he's right where he belongs because he's, you know, so you see where that goes? Okay. As far as he's concerned, that's... that's as, far as, as, as far as the Pharisees are concerned, he's right where he lives. Absolutely. Yes, please. Go ahead. I'll probably stand up because I have no other choice. You have, okay. Now... The fact that, that and you, you started it, there was a glimmer, either one, the idea there was a glimmer that said, you know what, this guy's acting different towards me. He's not condemning me. He's not doing this. He's this and he's this. What do I have to lose? Now, here's my point. I don't know at what level. I don't know exactly what it is, but he stood up. He tried and it worked. And Jesus knew and that man knew. And then all of a sudden, Jesus disappears. <laughs> I love it. He's not even there to sit there and say, oh, you know, you know he, he doesn't. He's gone. Where does he find them afterwards? Jesus sees him in the temple right where he told him to go. He says, you've got to go check in with the priests. And they declare you to be healed. And do it before you say anything about me. Because if they know that I did this, they'll say, no, you're not. Just out of spite and you'll lose. And so Jesus says, so go, go do and don't sin no more. I don't know what he did wrong. We're not told that. That's not necessarily the big thing. But notice how Jesus was able to awaken. And that's a word that the Tsar of Ages likes to use a lot. It awakened in him to do this. And they said, there's hope. There's something that's there. And Jesus took the risk to do that on the Sabbath day. Now, um, the last thing I want us to do here, let's take a look. The man had no idea who the man was. Really? Did this happen as a common occurrence? <laughs> you know, I mean, think about some of these questions here. Here's another one. Did those who questioned the man at least have an idea who healed the man? Oh, yeah. Pharisees knew exactly who it was. But it wasn't until they'd already said it was clean. Okay? Please. What's important? Okay. What's important is to me is the man walked up to this blind, I mean this lame man, and started having conversation with him. And pretty obviously, for 38 years, people have been ignoring me, sitting at this pool of the pagans, uh, hoping to be doused first. And, and so. Just with that one thing, that, that a man walked up to him before it was time for the water to be churned and ask him. So you see. That right there, I think, it, it, is where the two neurons of faith are sparking between. Because he sees compassion, he, he, he experiences compassion. Okay, did Jesus heal the man to provoke a discussion with the pious ones? Did he do, was this, was, was this his agenda? No. Okay, now, it turned into one. It turned into one. You've got to understand it. It did. And finally, a short quiz. Now, before we get going with that, I'm going to go back there because I don't want you messing with that one because we're going to have a little fun as we end up. Now, here's my point. We just went through a story that most of us already know. Did you learn something different because you started asking yourself different kinds of questions and all of a sudden you started saying, wait a minute here, if I was there, this is what I would be looking for or this is what I see Jesus doing when I, I didn't really take the time to think this kind of stuff. You see, what we have just been talking, and is it Dave? Okay, Dave brought up something that's really important. Do you realize that this is evangelism? We're talking about evangelism. Do you realize walking up to somebody and say, can I help you? Can I, can, can, you know, it looks like you need some, can I help you with that? Can, can we do, hey, kids, we can do this. This is not hard stuff. When you see somebody, you know, that's doing something, can you help them? Those are simple things. You say, why, why me? Why did you do that? I don't understand. Well, because you needed help, that's all. You don't have to sit there and give them a Bible study necessarily. You just sit there and say, oh, just, you needed some help. That's fine. That's okay, cool. See, this is what Jesus did. After a while, you start saying, you know what, I'm hearing about this. 
And then all of a sudden, people sit there and say, Have, did you see there was this person over here that did this and this and this? And you know, you know what? That really made my day. Hey, you, we don't need the glory. We sit there and say, somebody gave them that kind of a thing and made their life something meaningful. That's evangelism. Okay? Now, the last thing we're going to end up with is a quiz. And it's not the kind of quiz. It's going to be open book. And I'm going to ask you some questions when we get at the end. So read it. I'm going to leave it up, and then I'll ask you questions. Ready for some questions? Okay. Where did the person put the gophers? The dog chased them. Huh? The dog chased them. No, I said, where did they put them? Well, okay, possibility. Okay. Uh, why did she, why was she? Disappointed that the guests failed to bring their motorcycles. Trying to make a statement in their neighborhood. Well, could be. Okay. So, who made the threatening phone calls? She did. Yeah. Okay. Um, what did the What did the ad say in the classified section? Huh? What? Oh, good. I'm glad. Oh, it does. It does make sense. <laughs> Except there's one piece missing. Can anybody tell me what the one piece that's missing? What was the question? Okay, what is the piece that's missing? And looking at that, there's just there's one thing that you'd really like to know. What was in the last letter? Oh, it would have been in the last letter, yeah, or, or in the... Okay. Who wrote the letter? No, it, it, not who. You know what the letter said? You know what the ad said? House for sale. House for sale. Where did she put the gophers? In where? In the yard. Yeah. In what yard? Yes! Now, where did she put the gophers? In the, neighbor's In the neighbor's yard. Okay, why would she want her friends to come up with their motorcycles? Make to make a lot of noise, okay? What, um, who made the threatening phone calls? She did. she did, okay? What finally got her? The blinking lights across the street finally did the trick. What did the cla classified say? House for sale. It was for trophy of money. That's correct. Okay, so now, here's the interesting part. You did, what was missing? What was missing in all of this? It wasn't just the letter. There was one piece of information you needed to know. Huh? Well, no, well even more so, what was her intentions? What was she trying to accomplish? What's God trying to accomplish? Have we ever thought about what God wants, what He's trying to accomplish? 
Why does he do all of these things that he did? He creates a world. He does this. He puts up with a bunch of rebellious people who are, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Things get so bad, he's, you know, it's just, you've got to start over again. You've got to do all. What's he doing this for? What? Try to sell a house. No, so he can, he can show his love to me. He wants his children home. People? <laughs> can you imagine? We have not thought. He's done all of this to just get his kids home. That's you and me. Young, old, didn't make any difference. We're his kids. He says, I want my kids home. And parents, you know what that's like. Kids, you're going to learn what that means. But we all learn this. And we sit there and you just go, you want me? It's like the guy that was sitting there for 38 years. Somebody came up in me and was concerned about me. Jesus says, I've been doing this all along. You've not seen it. The tragedy in life is not what men suffer. It's what we miss. And that's what we're missing. We're not seeing that God wants us home that bad. That He will do whatever it takes to get us home. And if we don't start reading our Bibles with that in mind, you go, well then what's the purpose of being here? That's what this is about. And to tell others, guess what? Our Heavenly Father. Well, how do you know it? Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that kind of stuff. But I want you to start thinking in new thoughts here. That there are simple, that this is a simple story. It's a incredibly simple story. And yet it's very, very complex. And I am not going to deny that. But there are things that we can see by A, reading the story, as well as looking at the rules are. Now, theology tends to be more rules or this is the way it is than philosophy and, and this is the way we do it and process and all that. And, and that's good. Please don't misunderstand. We have to have that. But we're not balancing it with the story. And that's the reason why I have found that young people don't get all that interested. And I'll be honest, this, those of us that are older, we're there too. You know, well, I believe it, yes, but... See, and that's what we need. Do you know how many people outside these walls need to hear this? See, that's what this is about. So, tomorrow, this is what we're going to do. We're going to start talking about our... The first thing is, is that why do we need salvation? We need to reevaluate exactly what the problem is. If we're talking about family issues, then we're talking about, well, what needs to actually happen? What went wrong that made us go there? So that's the first thing. So we're going to study Genesis 1 through 4 in ways that maybe you've never looked at it before. The second thing we're going to look during church, we're going to look at the story of Jacob. You want to talk about a guy that's got problems? This guy had all kinds of problems. Gentlemen, four wives. This guy's a glutton for punishment. I'm sorry. Ladies, it's not on you, but you guys had your day. I mean, those ladies, you know, that was that kind of... Can you imagine kids growing up in that kind of a situation? And you wonder why all of that stuff goes? I'm going to show you the coolest thing that God does for Jacob. It is so cool. It is so neat. And it's the way it's told that's even better. Okay? All right. Then in the afternoon, we're going to talk about how Joseph ends up. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that the story of, of Genesis starts out with the way it was supposed to be. Okay? That was God's ideal. And then Adam and Eve messed it up with God which then led to their children to murder. In two generations, it got that fast. We better know what that sin is and what causes it and what leads to it and all that kind of stuff. Then you get down to Noah. And Noah, man, people get so upset. God, I can't, I can't worship a God who just destroys people like that with a flood. I said, God didn't do that. What do you mean he didn't do that? Yes, he did. I said, no, he didn't. He didn't kill them. 
Well, how do you know that? Well, it's really simple. First of all, he asked Noah to build an ark that's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, and only eight people got on it. The problem was they didn't want to get on the boat. That's their choice. That's their thing, not God. There was no reason for anybody to be lost. But that's what they did. Okay? So then they come back and now they sit there after the flood. They sit there, well, we're going to protect ourselves and we're just going to leave God out of the picture altogether. That's the Tower of Babel. Then Abraham, really interesting. Abraham and Sarah end up reconnecting with God that Adam and Eve lost. Then you have two brothers who are about ready to kill each other, but they don't. And they reconcile. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau. Joseph pulls the most dysfunctional family together as one at a time that is the opposite of what was happening in the days of Noah. And then all of a sudden we start saying, you know what, God, I'm starting to see a pattern here. I'm seeing how you can take the biggest mess and clean it up to where people will look and hug each other like you've never seen before. I want to show you that you can follow these patterns that God does over and over and over again and how those stories are told to where you sit there and say, man, how could I have possibly not realize how much a God is a God of love in the Old Testament? That's, so that's what we're going to do tomorrow. I am hoping to see you. We're going to start at what, 930? 945. 945. Please be here on time because I'll be honest, I will go all day. Only because of this. I don't, I don't want to burden you. I don't want anything like that. But when I get on this, I, I, you know, the adrenaline starts flying. You can see this. And I, it just really excites me to watch it. Do you realize what was happening? You guys were sitting there and you were all just involved. This is what Sabbath school should be like, people. This is the way it should be working. When you do that, then we can start learning. Yes, please. They weren't involved. They weren't involved. <laughs> And so, by pointing that out, what are you telling us all? It's your fault. Yeah, well, guess what? Beware. When you point the finger, it might be pointing back at you too. Huh. Judge not. No, no. Here's the word. Judge not lest you judge yourself. Yeah. Anyway, we'll talk later. But anyway, people, thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry I went a little bit beyond there but I hope you had a good time people I really do and I hope that you will come back with your Bibles because I'll be honest we can't do it and if you mark them that's fine if you don't that's okay too but bring a notebook or whatever you might want it and there the other thing I want to point out to you is I'm going to give you some handouts at tomorrow at the end of the meetings that will give you some things to kind of give you some hints and um, so I, I want to give you something that you can work with but um, we went over some, a lot of material tonight, and I realized I might give you spiritual indigestion. I'm really not trying to, but I just, I'm only here for today and tomorrow. So anyway, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, this has been an experience for, 